Hello, my name is Travis Vickerson, and today we're going to talk about slings, connections, and other aspects of crane work in relation to TCI Tree Care Academy Crane Operations Specialist Book. Next one to chapter five. So we're halfway through the TCI Tree Care Academy Crane Operations Specialist Book. Uh, we're in chapter five, or module five, which is slings, fittings, and connections. Um, the other book we have here is the Crane BMP. Uh, yes, Stephen Connolly, there is a math error inside this book that got translated wrong. Um, good catch on that as well. Uh, you say you're not good at math, but good job on catching the, um, the math error there. So when we're talking about slings and connections, what we're talking about is the wire rope, chains, nylon, rope slings, all the different things that are going to hang off of our block to our load. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about slings. So they could be a wire rope sling. They could be a chain sling. They could be nylon slings, rope slings, so forth. We're talking about connections. We're talking about the hooks and shackles that we're actually utilizing um, to either bind our load to our sling or, in some cases, the sling to our ball or our, our block up here. So we were both using connections in both aspects. Um, just some things that go there. So we're talking about slings. The very first thing is we have to understand the OSHA requirements for slings. All slings are required by OSHA to have an ID tag on them. So you can't just go make a sling from home from old bull rope you have lying around that doesn't have an OSHA rated tag on it. It has to have a tag and there's four things that have to be present on all tags in regards to crane work. The very first thing is you have to have the capacities for use. Those capacities for use have to come in three different configurations. A vertical, which would be if we had this sling here. Thank you, Tree Stuff, for the micro uh, whoopee here. So straight line pull, that's a vertical configuration. If we were to have a shackle here and a shackle here to say an eye bolt and a piece of concrete, that's a vertical pull. All right. Then you have a choker. Choker is exactly that. If we choke the piece off to a piece of material, that is the rated capacity for the sling as a choker. And then we have basket configuration. Basket is making exactly that. We are taking the load and hooking it back up to the block and having two parts of sling hang down with no joining in the middle and the piece just sits there. Obviously, some very big inherent dangers in using this configuration in tree work as this piece has nothing to hold it in place. You can imagine if that was a log, that could go through a people's house, deck, person pretty easily. So the majority of what we use our slings for is in the choker configuration. Either it be using a regular shackle to choke something back off, using a soft shackle, using a knot of some form, be it a running bowline, a closed clove, something like that. Some way in which you're creating a bend on the rope at one position, one termination, that's considered a choker. The next thing you have to have is you have to have the material being utilized. So it has to, we have to know the kind of material that the sling is made of. Is it going to be a nylon sling, a um, chain sling, what kind of chain is it rated for, and those so forth. Next is the code and stock number. So you have to have a code or stock number for every sling. That is a unique identifier. And then you have to have the manufacturer ID. Right? So if a manufacturer ID, if it's a Lift X or if it's a – you know, Tufelberger product. Um, I run the Tufelberger crane slings. Those are slings I enjoy and I like. That's the manufacturer ID. I see Nick's got a question real quick. Do you have an I? Do you have a? Do you have to tag it with three ratings if it's a dead eye sling that wouldn't be used in a basket configuration? Yes, Nick. Um, you still have to have the three different configurations and the rated capacities, even if you're not going to utilize it in that fashion, per the OSHA regulation. So as silly as that might sound, and I don't know, Cal OSHA may be slightly different because um, it's California and everything's different. So check with Cal OSHA on that to be specific to your state. Um, but I know most states require it no matter what. You still have to have all three configurations identified and their capacities, even if you're only going to be utilizing it in one configuration. All right. Next, we're going to look at our sling angles. All right. Where our sling angles come into play is when we're having multiple slings on and how that changes the capacity, all right? So if we had this sling here, and we're just gonna kind of use our, a little bit of our imagination here, and it was 
through our crane this way. And let me make another termination here. The angle that we're creating here, this is the sling angle we're referring to. All right. The closer this gets together, the stronger capacity our sling has. The further apart these get, the weaker our capacity has. So if this sling is coming up directly at a 90 degree angle, so if we get it to the point where we're at a 90 degree angle like this, and say this piece weighs 1,000 pounds here, each leg of this sling is only holding 500 pounds. But as we move further away, that changes. Once we get to a 45 degree angle, you have a 1,000 pound piece. This leg has had 707 pounds. This leg has 707 pounds. And then there is 500 pounds actually of pressure being applied this way on this piece. So this piece is actually being compressed with 500 pounds of pressure this way. As you continue to work on up and shorten your sling, so oh, back there. if I were to say bind this thing somewhere around here, it's kind of hard to see, and our sling gets really flat angles, now we're having more pressure applied at the piece and our capacity is diminished even further. The easiest way to figure this out is take the height of attachment to the, to the ball, to your piece, the distance from here to here, divided by the length of the sling from here to here times its rate of capacity. And that will tell you the lifting capacity for that angle at that sling. Now, for most of our stuff we do, we go back to this kind of configuration the majority of the time. We're operating straight down, 90 degree angle, and we just simply have to use the capacity of a choker. But in the event that we were using this as a choker, as such, like I showed you a minute ago, we would take the height divided by the length times the choker capacity for this sling would tell us how much this lifting capacity for this sling would be on this piece. This is one of our failure points in doing crane work. We know the weight of our crane can hold. We know how much the piece is going to hold. We also need to know what our rigging can hold. Right. Next, we're going to look at the connections. So the shackles we use. Uh, there's three different types of shackles shown here. There is the screw lock shackle where it actually has a pin in it that you can screw shut. So it actually has a bolt with a pin on it. You have the actual screw shackle, the old style that just screws into itself. And then you have a quick turn clevis or quick turn shackle. All three are very, work very well in tree care. Um, there are some inherent problems with each one. Um, so just make sure you understand how those work and apply differently. The big thing here with shackles is you never want to exceed 120 degree angles on the shackle in the direction of which the slings are being pulled. On the Crosby shackles, they're actually, they put indicators on the Crosby shackles for the sling to not exceed that. So you're not pulling the shackle the wrong direction that it's not rated for. All right. Just a little um, graphic here to show kind of some problems with how slings can be loaded into the hook differently with the hook bunching up, with the slap, straps being laid over themselves and so forth. Real simple, easy stuff. Next, we're going to look at our actual sling types. So here we have a dead eye sling with balancer pieces on it. You've got endless round slings. And then you have a choked off sling, endless round sling that's sloped off with a screw lock shackle. In this image here, the screw part is on the non-moving section of the endless round sling. It's really, really where we want it. If you were to put that on the other side, you run the potential of that screw being turned and backed out of the shackle or being put so tight when it gets to the ground, your ground crew has a hard time getting it open. Using a scrunch like that to get it open isn't ideal. So just make sure that it's in the non-moving part of the, the round sling when it's applied to the tree. All right. Also, we have soft shackles. Soft shackle is a rope product that has a whoopee style motion on it on the round piece. And it has a knot on the other side. And I'm going to try to do my best here to kind of show what that would look like. All right. So if I slide this all the way down, I've got my end here. All right. If I were to pass this through here, and this was my knotted end, all right, and then I tighten this down, this knot can't pass through this because all of this has got friction on it here. So this is, was a knot, and say it's not a loop, it's a knot. That soft shackle now can't pass through here. That creates the soft shackle. They're a great tool. They actually come from the towing and recovery um, 
industry, been around a long time, been used a long time in the towing industry, have a huge use for us in tree care. The biggest downside is over time, they do have a tendency to stretch, they do have a tendency to wear out. So you have to police that and just make sure that they're staying tight and being utilized correctly by the climbers and ground crew and being treated correctly because it is a soft product. The advantage of there is it is a soft product. If you were to drop it from the top of a tree, you don't have to worry about it damaging somebody or damaging some property as you would with a metal shackle. Um, so there's a there's a nice part there. As a climber, you could carry multiple of these on your saddle. They don't weigh a whole lot. It just gives you more options there for quick attachments. All right, last we're going to talk about cli the climber connection. We're going to talk about how the climber connects to the crane. Uh, what you have here is the Z133 requirement, which is the Z133 5.7.11 and 5.7.11.2.2, is in regards to the climber being tied in twice while hoisting. So the two tie-in points, you have to have one above the block and then a second tie-in point through the throat of the hook. This is only required when hoisting. So while you are being hoisted from the ground level up into the canopy, once you are into the canopy, you are now what's considered in work positioning. You are no longer in the hoisting fashion. You are in work positioning. Therefore, you do not have to have the two points of attachment. It is only for in hoisting because we feel that the highest chance of having an injury or an incident is in that hoist there that is occurring. We had a fatality in New England last year where a climber's bridge failed while in the hoist um, position, was only tied in once, didn't have that second tie-in, and therefore ended up in a fatality. Um, so just make sure when you're getting lifted off the ground, you've got your primary tie-in above the ball or above the hook. And then you have your uh, secondary tie-in through the shackle, or I mean, not through the shackle, I'm sorry, through the block. And the, what I do is I use my lanyard, run my lanyard through the block and back on my saddle, and that's my second attachment point. Really easy, really simple, nothing, nothing too complex there. There's lots of different ways to attach a climber to a load line. Um, there's the one, the kit that tree stuff sells. Um, there is the ability to put a shackle on the load line to a ring and ring. You could girth um, a ring and ring. You could build what I had, uh, Reed Wortley uh, built for me in this picture here, which is two opposing gate captive eye steel carabiners with EpiCord lock stitched together to two steel rings at the bottom. Uh, it's a product that Reed Wortley made for me, and it's a great product. I love it. Um, it allows me to just clip it right on my load line, and, I, and I'm good to go. So there's different ways to do it. Again, not a lot of right ways, but there are some wrong ways. Um, you never want to make sure – you always want to make sure that you don't have any soft product in contact with your load line. Load line sims, they have a lot of burrs in them, a lot of metal, a lot of grease. So you really wouldn't want a soft product in direct contact with your load line. There's potential there it can get cut and can have a fall, something that way. Thank you for tuning in for this module. Hopefully you got a lot of information out of it and can utilize this information to help you complete the Tree Care Academy Crane Operations Specialist book.